this entire saga started off with me trying to work with Beagle Play and blink a few LEDs. Sounded like a simple task, but well, I can create some slides out of it. But before we go there, uh, who are we? This is TI. Um, we have the mentality of upstream first. There's a lot of marketing stuff around it. But we try to contribute to the upstream communities in various ways, among which is to contribute code back. Uh, a little about me. This happens to be the first presentation ever from my oh. side. Mm. And you guys are the guinea pigs. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm a long-term um, TIR. Uh, and I've been working with Linux kernel since early in my career back in 2004 time frame. My entrance into Zephyr has been very recent, but U-Boot and kernel, I kind of help a bit, bit here and there. Bottom line, I'm the guy who uses the sink. I'm not the plumber, right? And you guys are. So I can tell the experience of me using the sink here uh, and some suggestions how to fix the plumbing. Um, and this entire story goes into that detail. So again, the hope is this is a pure technology presentation. Uh, don't take anything that I'm talking here as what the detail ma maintainers are saying or my company is talking about, blah, blah, blah. So, And of course, I'm not going to solve the entire world's DT problems here either. What, what's wrong with device? It's perfect, right? <clears throat> anyway, so for folks who are not aware of device, is there anyone here? Because I'm going to give throw Chris thing over at you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, quick short summary of what the device tree is. Um, looking at the perspectives of device tree from different processes. If you guys have attended the, um, the embedded Linux summary that Tim Bird was giving. He spoke about multi-core challenge. This is an example exactly of that problem. Um, what I like about the approaches that we have taken on device tree in kernel, in U-Boot, and in Zephyr, and we'll see some of the challenges that we see from that perspective. Anyway, so quick summary, there's a beautiful um, presentation by Neil Armstrong. It gives a beautiful history of what device tree came into being I know, I had to pull up the history. Um, the entire debate about whether device tree should be the way it is or should it be YAML. Um, if you folks way back then remember Benoit Kosova his initial purchase on YAML, um, how we tried to convert the entire device tree into YAML, that didn't succeed. So we have where we are. We have device tree bindings in YAML and device tree the way it is today. Um, since then, we have had a few evolutions. We have seen device tree overlays come into play. Uh, that's a big debate session of its own. Uh, and we have seen its adoption in various other software ecosystems. So again, as I was saying, I started off um, working on Beagle Play. And I was like, hey, we've got six LEDs sitting around. Let's blink one LED from the A53 and another LED from the M4 shouldn't be a big deal is what I thought. A year later, I still haven't managed to do that. And let's talk about why. So uh, to understand this entire problem, we need to look at heterogeneous systems. Most folks who are working on Zephyr, um, compared to the processes you are typically working on, this is probably complex, but compared to the regular TI processes that we work on, this is a microcontroller. Okay. And this is probably the most simplest of all processes we have. Uh, by itself, it is um, it's heterogeneous in nature. Um, the, it, there are four A53s, even though I just show a single A53. There's an R5F, which is multi-use, and M4, which is where I intended to run Zephyr. Uh, and then there is this wake-up domain that does its special power management stuff on the other side. Let's keep the simple view instead of taking the complex peripheral view in play. So we are going to look at this from three different perspectives. Linux, which we are aware of. Um, sorry, this is the first session. Oh, wrong place. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> so since it's plumbers, uh, 
you have you boot guys who are also using device tree uh, for good reasons and zephyr which is attempting to use device tree i've left a fourth guy out of this picture which is tfa uh, tfa has capability of using oh for folks trusted firmware cortex a it has capability of using device tree but let's not bring that complexity to this picture yet so i'm going for the instead of picking on linux zephyr i'm just going to use People terminology. So our Penguin Peak World ecosystem, Christoph, don't beat me up yet. Um, <laughs> uh, so we have schema. Everything revolves around the schema. Schema says, how should you write your device tree? And device tree follows the schema. Uh, for folks who have done uh, DT schema checks and um, the usual W equal to 2 uh, DT checks, um, maybe I'm messing up the names up. Anyway, you folks would have seen the Python warnings that come into play. And if you're sending a device to patch, usually you will get response back from Rob Herring's uh, patchwork saying that it doesn't meet the schema, it doesn't build well. There's a beautiful framework in the backend that actually does that. The device tree compiler by itself is a separate project which gets imported into the kernel device tree. I mean, kernel tree as such. But the core definition of what a driver's represent, I mean, it peripherals representation is uh, in Linux kernel, the canonical source is kernel.r and Linux tree. So that's kind of the baseline. It's beautiful for folks who are working with Linux, everything is perfect, except for one little detail. The world looks, the Linux world looks at the device tree from the perspective of Linux. Everything happens from A53's perspective. And that's how the peripherals look like. A um, few examples, your root node says, what are your CPUs? I have a gig on the root node. If you're an M4 guy and you look at that perspective and you're like, why is it all talking from A53's perspective? But that's the perspective which we create the device in Linux kernel. So how does the device reaction look for AM6 to 5 uh, in Linux kernel? Uh, we had the intent early on that device tree should be um, agnostic of which processor we look from. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the A53 view, which is represented by am625.dtsi. And there can be a few variants of it, depending on how our marketing people decide to enable disable A53s, but that aside. Um, then we have the am62.dtsi, which is the integration of the entire bus, similar to the view that you just saw before, main domain, MC domain, and makeup domain. <laughs> And the actual peripherals in each of those domains are in the DTSI files corresponding to the bus. Looks simple. It kind of indicates how the SOC is kind of built up, but from the perspective of a 53 view. Now, our good friends in the little submarine, um, oh, we see the colors. Um, they decided that they don't want to reinvent this entire world because there's a lot of fixes that are happening in kernel because many of the device tree properties like uh, timing uh, how much delay should um, the reset look like all those details are better done in the kernel and they would like to import this in so they still use the same tools dtc um, and libftt to actually parse the device tree they actually use the device tree blob as the input but then they needed some special features on top. Um, Binman, anybody? No Binman fans? Um, well, for folks who are not familiar with the submarine world, uh, the way images are created, uh, there is uh, something called as Binman, which again describes how the image contents are put together and how to sign them uh, and creates the final image for you. Uh, fit image is kind of the standard that people use, but X509 is also something that it is capable of doing. It's kind of the in thing now, at least in the TI world. But it's again a software representation of how these pieces are put together. Remember, the rule in kernel was we describe hardware. But how you use the hardware from a software perspective, there are some nuances involved. Ubud is an example where there are real nuances. Partitions is, a, um, is an example of how your SD card or OSPI partitions are kind of split into different sections. 
So um, the other interesting thing is the licensing terms of U-Boot. U-Boot likes to use GPLv2 plus versus Linux kernel is GPLv2, even though there are multi-license instances as well. Now, when it comes to AM625, there's a duality for U-Boot um, from TI perspective. There are two builds of U-Boot that actually exist. There's a U-Boot build that actually runs on the R5 before it hands over control to the A53 set. So the same peripheral set is getting handed over from R5 to A53 on the fly. So now you need to have a representation of the same device tree represented from the perspective of R5 initially, and then switch that perspective from A53 perspective. A53 is relatively easy. Colonel has solved that for us. So what we do um, in U boot upstream is that we import the entire kernel device tree in. And then we overlay a couple of DTSIs on top. So we use U boot or DTSI to bring in the U boot specifics like binman and boot pH, boot pH properties. But slowly we have started introducing into kernel. Just have never heard that. Um, <laughs> but there are some nuances there. Um, and then you. Pre uh, introduce the R5 perspective on top. What is, when you're looking from R5, you're looking from a 32-bit address space. Mm. The intervector controller is different. Your properties look slightly different. Even the absolute addresses of these peripherals are the same, no matter where you're looking at, at them from. But this is what we did in u -Boot. So far, so good. It still works fine. Then we started into a height ecosystem. Um, mm. That was a bit of a surprise for me. Um, before we officially got involved, um, we are not officially involved yet. And he keeps reminding me that we have to send pull requests in. Yes, sir. Uh, but it's an interesting study. A uh, lot of community folks decided that they want AM65 enabled in Zephyr. Great. So the way they introduced the stuff um, was probably convenient uh, to introduce things in but it doesn't benefit the way you boot does. And let's go into the details. So it, Zephyr overall, there are native drivers that are possible. You can create Zephyr with a HAL, with you know, some vendor BSP HAL layer that you can integrate in. So there are different ways of skinning Zephyr cat. The key thing that Zephyr tries to maintain is real time and resource constraints. And everything is designed around that. So, it takes device trees and bindings that it has, generates C headers, which I've never seen in any other ecosystem. Everybody seems to be using blocks. And macrobatics, is that the term that's yeah, famous? Uh, Marty, yeah. There you, you go. Say thanks, Marty. Uh, that was like a bit of a shock to me. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so it takes that, and, uh, and there are specific ways in which you can use it, and, and for good reasons. And, performance being one of the key points. So the perspective of Zephyr today, um, if you look at the Zephyr mainline, and there's an implementation of Zephyr for AM625 from A53's perspective, and there's one from M4F perspective. Uh, we don't use R5 in that context. The way it actually turned out to be is something similar to what I'm showing in this diagram. Uh, you can look at the sources completely separate device trees. No uh, reuse among them. So if you have an I2C peripheral that is on the main domain and you want to use it from A53, you have to rewrite that device tree node on the A53 side and then replicate that yet again on the M4F side. That's how it is looking like right now. So essentially there are two DTSI files which represent the same chip from two different perspectives. Okay. And then you have the board files that come on top as natural, which import this in. And of course, macros everywhere. Uh, if you decide to change something, you probably want to read that link uh, to figure out how to build Zephyr successfully. Um, anyway, no offense, but there are good reasons though, right? And then there are other perspectives too. AM625 is also enabled in Jailhouse, which happens to be another virtualization environment. Entirely different implementation, different perspective altogether. It's the same thing that we are trying to describe. 
the only thing that is common between everything that we spoke of is the word device tree. That's it. So for me, it's I'm sorry to use a biblical term like Babel, Tower of Babel. So that's how it feels like. The things that I like about Linux kernel, the bindings are very strict. That's good, right? That way you're forced to write something that others can understand. You can create tooling around that. Um, what can and cannot be integrated is also relatively clear. Um, Christoph is one of our best friends who will keep reminding us you can't have software properties in device trees. Please, no, let's not do that. You and can if it's a pseudo device. That's okay. Sorry? You can if it's a pseudo device, but only some people think that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so rules are at least clear what can and cannot do. So I, as a kernel maintainer, just don't have to go and um, negotiate with developers saying that. I will let you do this because the rules are clear though. When it comes to u boot, the integration is very clean. Okay? But there are some special bindings that we have, but there's no DT bindings check. u boot doesn't have it. So you can write the bindings as long as you want. You can write your device to completely independent of it. There's no correlation between these two. The language tends to be same-ish. So for customers who are used to main GPU zero, some ID, they use the same thing in Ubuntu. They don't know the difference. They use the same language. They don't have to relearn anything over that. So that's good. Um, but it is bloated. Um, for folks who love boot time optimization, if you trace libftt, it's an experience especially the string compare operations when you have optional properties going through, uh, which is the primary reason we chose not to go with device tree in TFA, uh, because it was so much time critical operation for us. Zephyr, what I love about Zephyr is the pure manic focus on performance, resource constraints. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Why? My management is going to kill me for the next statement. Um, TI is cheap. So we like to put very little SRAM on the chip. <laughs> so. <laughs> he didn't hear anything. <laughs> optimized, SRAM optimized devices. So Zephyr is perfect for that kind of an environment. Being able to define device tree in that ecosystem is perfect, right? Uh, you have a tightly coupled memory that you can limit, however limited in size you still get the flexibility of getting a more complex stack um, without the overheads of libftd, FDT. Anyway, so this is my takeaway about the likes. The dislikes, obviously. Uh, the same reason why I like Linux kernel device tree is the same reason I don't like device tree uh, in Linux kernel. I, like, I don't like the fact that, um, did I? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't like the fact that we can't de describe the software usability model in device in Linux kernel. Um, and that is a need coming from people. Uh, we try to solve that problem with overlays to an extent. The best answer people say is move it into your drivers. Um, fine. And you have systems where the clock data, for example, is entirely hidden in the, in the, in the kernel data structures. And part of the description is available in the device tree saying, I am so-and-so compatible. But the actual data, the actual hardware data is actually inside the driver. So there are things like that. Um, E-probe differ, anybody? It, good fans, right? But there's a good reason why it exists. But every time I see minus 517, 516, whatever, I'm like, it's time lost in my boot time. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of effort in trying to optimize that and trying to find solutions around it. U-boot, on the other hand, more you look at it, more you start crying. Um, um, it feels like a bunch of Band-Aid after Band-Aid. Uh, Tom, if you're listening, and he's not commenting, so uh, don't beat me up on it. I understand that we are evolving to a better situation. Uh, and Zephyr, I'm sorry, you don't use device tree. I, I know we like to use the term device tree, but it is not device tree as in the Linux kernel. Uh, the, for folks who are used to a language, you're training us to learn something entirely different. GPO Nexus, 
GPN Access is a good example. Um, the way Zephyr likes it is that 32-bit, uh, you need a node. Uh, the way we like it is that GPO block is a single node. Um, but no, not on Zephyr. We need to have sub nodes representing each 32-bit block in as a sub node of the main GPO node. Yeah, that's a short, that's a shortcoming. I would agree with you. I used to do a lot of GPO stuff, and that's for sure a shortcoming. I think that we should be able to support more than 32. Yeah. yeah so so the, the, the complaint is that there's a language that we all agree on. This is how a GPO node should look like. There's a GPO binding. We all agree on that language. And then our software ecosystem uses it. The pain that we are putting on our ecosystem is bad. We are retraining people over and over, learning different language all over. Anyway, that's my complaint. As I said, I'm the user of the sink. I'm not the plumber. I need your help. So is there a middle ground in this? So, okay, disclaimer. I work for OpenAMP. Okay, I work with the OpenAMP team. Uh, which is attempting to help solve this heterogeneous system problem. What it, uh, the Xilinx and AMD folks have actually taken a lot of effort in coming up with Lopper, and I wish Bruce was around, unfortunately. There is a solution out here. They call it system device tree. But if you ignore the word system device tree, the semantics of what it uses is exactly what we need. Kernel device tree has a beautiful language of describing every peripheral out there. System device tree has the tools to link a perspective onto that language and generate an output that follows the same language. The question is, is the software ecosystem willing to pick that up? I, I, I believe, I think that it should be, if, not, if it's not already supported in Zephyr, it's like on the verge of being supported in Zephyr. And my ask is a little more broader than that. Can you boot pick it up? Okay, so, good question. That drives into what my asks are. Not just Zephyr, right? There has to be a canonical source that we can look for. Remember back in the day that we used to talk about device tree shall move out of the kernel? I'm not holding my breath anymore. I've tried to wait for it. We actually did spin off a Git tree inside TI with the hope that device tree will eventually get out of kernel.org uh, or you know the kernel tree, but that has not happened. And I don't foresee that happen. Um, I'm not asking for device tree to be put in ROM. I know that's not going to happen either. The box? Ooh, uh, how do I scroll down to the actual comments? What is Lopper again? I'm sorry, I don't remember. Uh, so, okay, so Lopper happens to be a tool that uh, the, so there's a link over there as well that you can look into. And there's a beautiful presentation from Linaro Connect, I think. Yeah back in 19, that talks about it. The idea is the same. Um, they wanted to look at system device tree as the device tree canonical source of description of the device, and then use a personality to generate a device specific view. Their intent was to go all the way into Zen support, Linux kernel, and various other software ecosystem. But then we had to create this language called system device tree, which yeah. really doesn't need to exist. Why can't we delete? the device trees from the kernel today. Sorry? Why not just send the patch today to rip it out? We did this with firmware. We separated out all the firmware files and we, they lived in a firmware directory in the kernel for literally years. Until finally at a conference, we said, uh, yeah, it's been in there for ages and it shouldn't be. Let's just send the patch to delete, delete it. And then it was gone. There is a separate repository. Exists. At devicetree.org, there is a device, there is a repo that is synchronized, yeah. and it's been there for a while. Rob, Christoph, if you guys are is, okay, is I guess this the patch. point? Is this the point <laughs> we want to discuss here in the last five minutes? Yeah, this, uh, this is one of the hot this topics. This has been discussed many, many times. So. <clears throat> I mean, I, I agree with you, but I, I'm not sure we're going to advance the topic today. So the, 
laziest option might be to introduce Lopperin into other ecosystem. Do an import of kernel device tree into U-Boot, which is happening, and into Zephyr. So that might be an option to do. Um, it has it comes with a great gain for developers like me because I get my patch found out, but I'm not proud of that. Uh, all I do is import. But beyond that, it at least ensures that the, the actual users of our products can la learn one language, which is the kernel device tree. A uh, couple points. So I, I think the people that feel this pain are people that are using AMP SOCs. That's right. Um, if you're using an MCU, you probably don't care about this issue. Um, so you... you Say that again. You will have this issue. If you're a yeah, heterogeneous MCU, you have the same yeah, problem. Interpret but and big. <clears throat> they're not running Linux, so you don't care that your device tree isn't exactly like the one in Linux. Okay. So I think the. specific SOC doesn't run Linux, you might be reusing a peripheral that is used in SOCs that do run Linux. You want the bindings to be the same. But I, I think the people that care about it the most are the AM, AMP SOCs. So we will want a solution for them first before we do the long tail of trying to convert every MCU in tree. Right. So there are certain personality behaviors that, like DMA, right? Which which DMA when it comes to which DMA instance that you're controlling, interrupts is our is our favorite. Uh, depending on which MCU you're working with and how the NVIC integration is, the interrupt that comes to your M4 or R5 looks different from the other guy, right? So there are these personality nuances that you need to plug into the problem. Well, so, uh, to me, that's something that Lopper could do. It can. Yeah. So what I've talked to Bruce about is taking the device tree that is checked into devicetree.org or the kernel and converting it with additional information into a system device tree. So instead of starting having to have a system device tree to start with, you could take the kernel device tree and mutate it into a system device tree. Um, and then you could even envision smartness that translated a GPIO node in, from Linux notation into Zephyr notation, transitional Zephyr notation. Um, and, and then we could, you know, go along with, with that sort of stuff. Lopper today on Xilinx, I mean, they, they input device tree and they spit out pound defines for their bare metal environment too. So the, it's not just device tree modifications, you can do other things. Since we are short on time, I'll just answer Rob's question yep. as well. So Rob was mentioning that most of the kernel device tree are dual license. I admit it's a self-inflicted wound. We chose to go with GPL license and kernel. We forgot that others are using it. So we need to move to a license mode, which is compatible with other systems. Just a clarification there. So time out, yep. So thank you folks.